Welcome to The Drawdown, a podcast by Cherry Beckert's private equity practice. In each episode, we explore the latest trends in the private equity sector, as well as challenges and opportunities in the ever-changing investment environment. Welcome to The Drawdown. I'm Cameron Smith. I lead business development and client services for Cherry Beckert's private equity practice. Today, we are discussing healthcare. In particular, the rise of the MSO and DSO. I'm joined by Steve Stang and Mike Ludwig, two partners in Cherry Beckert's Healthcare Transaction Advisory Group. This group performed financial diligence on over 160 healthcare transactions last year, predominantly for MSOs and DSOs, rolling up a large volume of medical and dental practices. Steve, Mike, glad to have you guys. Thanks, Cameron. Happy to be here. Same, Cameron. Thanks. In addition to discussing the rise of the MSO and DSO, Steve and Mike will drill down into the nuances associated with this mass roll-up activity and how Cherry Becker has responded to the demand with its new healthcare microdeals experience. Let's get started. Steve, would you first give us the high-level description of an MSO or a DSO? Sure, Cameron. Um, MSO or, or DSO, it's first of all, the definition uh, stands for Management Services Organization or, or Dental Services Organization. The, the model has actually been around for a while, um, but its use in, in certain sectors within healthcare has uh, really significantly increased um, in over the recent years, say the last five years in, in particular. Um, and especially with the use of private equity. But the model is um, essentially you create, if you want to make it in simplest terms, a management company uh, that sits above the uh, physician practice. Um, And the management company would then be the MSO or DSO. And from an operational standpoint, the way it works is all non-clinical um, assets in operations are moved from the physician practice into the management services organization. So the only thing left in the physician practice would be the providers themselves, people actually um, providing care specifically to the uh, the patients. So the, the doctors, the um, certified nurse assistants, uh, et cetera. And then the practice will pay a management fee up to the MSO um, on a monthly basis, which essentially moves all the profits up into the MSO. And so that's where the profits are shared. It's a vehicle that's uh, used often by um, private equity as they're doing transactions due to um, what's called the corporate practice of medicine laws in many states. And, And what those laws say is that you can only have a physician or you can only have a dentist that owns a um, physician practice. Um, and so in, in that circumstance, that provide that prevents an outside investor like a private equity fund to invest in the practice. Um, so to, to get around that, so to speak, that's where the MSO model was created. So now the private equity fund will invest in the MSO and um, the doctor will still own that practice, although all the profits end up residing in the MSO through the management services agreement. Got it. So it is the private equity platform. And from what we're seeing, this platform is acquiring numerous practices. Um, Mike, what would you say is sometimes 10, 12 per month? Um, What is so attractive about this roll-up strategy? And in the same regard, what are the challenges? There's a couple things here. So, so one of the things that makes this attractive is the relative consistency in the cash flows of these businesses. So, healthcare, specifically at the provider level, tends to lack cyclicality. So, whether you know you're you're in on certain times, like we're heading into now with talk of recession and slowing growth, you know, these businesses still tend to perform in a consistent manner. So that that becomes very attractive to these buyers. And and then there's also the side of of operating the business. So there's efficiencies to be realized when you take the doctor out of the business side 
of these practices and introduce economies of scale in, in areas of ordering supplies and managing people. And so the combination of those two things make these businesses very attractive when you start putting them together. Some of the challenges our investors see though in this process is there's a lack of sophistication in the finance function of the practices before they acquire them. And so what that means is, you know, a lot of times the numbers that the private equity firm receives from the sellers might not tell the whole story of what's happening at the practice. And, and there's also the idea that they're, the private equity firm could be managing multiple deals at the same time. And so project management becomes an issue uh, as these platforms tend to grow relatively quickly. And the, the, the third part of it is a lot of times there's an education factor that has to come into play for the sellers in these processes. So for the most part, a lot of these doctors that might be engaging with these private equity firms, this will be the only transaction process they experience in their career. So for them, a lot of it's the first time learning. And so that's where the, the process comes into play. Got it. Um, Steve, anything to add there regarding the attraction of the strategy versus the challenges? Yeah, I, I think as far as the, the the attraction and what makes it such an interesting sector for PE is um, the the disaggregation within healthcare. And what I mean by that is the the vast majority of of physician practices and dental practices in this country are still small independent um, organizations, small independent practices. You know, between one to to maybe five providers at a practice. Um, anything above five is actually starting to approach what you might want to call a large practice. Um, and, and as an example of that, uh, I know two years ago when I was doing some research, um, looking into radiology groups, that there were over 33,000 radiologists um, in the country. And if you looked at the largest um, independent radiology groups, um, that, like the top 25 or the top 50 in the country, there were only five practices that had over 100 radiology providers in it. Um, out of 33,000 total, um, only five of them exceeded 100 practices. Again, the vast majority of them are these smaller practices that are out there. And so what that means from um, from a PE standpoint, when they're looking at acquisitions, uh, it, it's a very fruitful or, or wide market um, of acquisitions to be. So even though it's a competitive market in, in looking for um, good quality practices, there are a lot of good practices out there um, to, to choose from or to pursue. I feel like I'm driving down the road and seeing more of these large branded dental practices and strip malls and other retail corners. Um, Mike, what's a compelling reason or reasons for sellers to take this path? Yeah, so at, at a high level, it, it really just allows a, a dentist to be a dentist, right? So they, uh, their their job is to work on people's teeth, not run a business. That that's not necessarily a strong point for these providers, and so that's the first thing. But but secondly, uh, a lot of these practices were either started or acquired with the use of bank debt, and so doing a transaction with a private equity firm allows these providers to get out from underneath the debt burden that the practice may have accumulated. And it, it really is a, a huge sense of relief knowing that you, you don't have these monthly debt payments and this, this overhang of, of debt when you're you're going to work every day. And then lastly, uh, it's been it's been the last couple of years where you've seen these multiples on these sales uh, stay pretty robust near near record highs. And so that continues to make it compelling for sellers to, to capitalize on a market where there is just so much demand. Yes, and as we all in M&A know, we've had record activity these past couple years, healthcare obviously included. Um, you guys see activity slowing? And as Steve, perhaps PE funds are absorbing these mass roll-ups, facing integration challenges, like you mentioned, economic headwinds? 
Well, we, we, we did see a slowdown in Q1, uh, but I believe that a lot of that was, was really people just catching their breath um, from, from the frenzy of uh, the end of 22, trying to close out deals. And so um, we're, we have seen it pick up, the deal volume activity pick up significantly since then. And, um, you know, while there are these these macro conditions out there, such as, you know, the, the rising interest rates, um, still some concerns over corporate taxes, you know, even the um, held interest tax rates was was on the table again here recently. Uh, all the talk about the recession, you know, there's a lot of concerns out there um, that that could be slowing down some private equity investment. But in, in healthcare, we really don't see as much of that. A lot of people like to say, and, and, and I'm one of them, that healthcare is generally recession proof. Um, and, I, and that's because, you know, it, it's a need and it's a service that everybody needs to have. It's not a want, it's a need. Um, and so the, the ability to invest in these practices, you don't see as much um, downturn activity when the rest of the economy turns down. Uh, one thing we did learn with COVID, though, is that while it may be recession proof, it's not access proof. Um, COVID was one of the first times where we saw a downturn in uh, healthcare because of the fact that people couldn't access their providers. They just physically couldn't get to them. And you know, telehealth hadn't picked up just yet. Uh, but you know, that, that was a, a rare you know, one in a hundred year type of event, we think. Um, and so we're, we're very bullish still on healthcare moving forward. Uh, we think it's going to have a strong end of this, this fiscal year, 23, and then also uh, going forward to see continued growth. Uh, in, in fact, when we, we look at our, our deal activity, uh, we're well above our pace last year. Again, we did over 160 healthcare deals last year, uh, and we expect to far exceed that here in fiscal year 23. Uh, Mike, your thoughts on activity in the sector? Yeah, so so based on the client, the the conversations we have with our clients, uh, their pipelines continue to grow, and I, I think it is the combination of some of the macro headwinds that are coming in, and uh, but but couple that with the experiences that some of the existing providers that have joined these platforms have had, and and the word of mouth impact that happens when. Uh, they talk to some of their colleagues, and then those colleagues become interested in, in joining these platforms as well. So we in Transaction Advisory, as our clients and colleagues are equally aware, were swamped in 2021 and still remain incredibly busy with diligence on deals now even approaching 2023. Uh, Steve, for healthcare deals in this massive volume play, how is Cherry Becker responding? Well, we went and studied the uh, what's the difference between platform acquisitions and add-on acquisitions in healthcare. And when we did it, we didn't do it from a uh, CPA firm doing financial diligence perspective. We actually did it from the MSO and the PE funds perspective and looked at it from pre-LOI activities to the post-close integration activities. And, and we asked ourselves, how can we make this experience better for the MSOs in the DSOs and and make the process much smoother. And the result was what we call the Cherry Becker microdeals experience. When we, we studied the differences of microdeals, we found uh, four key differences. Mike earlier mentioned the sheer volume of the number of transactions. You know, some of these buyers are doing up to 10 to 12 acquisitions a month. We also found that the level of diligence that's being done on these acquisitions is also less and generally less complex than it is on a larger platform activity. The third thing is that there is a much more difficult time integrating these practices. It's much easier to integrate a large platform practice that has uh, internal controls in place, qualified financial people, um, consistent systems that they're utilizing compared to these small practices that the systems that they utilize all over the board they're generally cash basis, and they often don't have the ability or, or, or financial um, wherewithal to be able to provide good financial information. Uh, and, and lastly, this is the only provide deal that providers will ever do. Um, it's a very emotional decision for them. It, it's their practice that they've built all by themselves. 
and in how we communicate and interact with them is much different than on a platform. Um, and so knowing those four differences, we created what we call our micro deals experience. Uh, first and foremost, we're using automation and technology to expedite the process. Uh, the, our, when we get the first general ledger download from a target, our goal is to have up to 75% of the financial diligence completed within a day or two. And so by automating a number of the adjustments that are routine, um, creating the different tables that we need, we can get a quick look at what does the practice look like on an adjusted basis and provide that to the buyer as well. So they'll be able to get a quick look at what does that look like compared to their internal valuation. We also created a deal status dashboard that is a one-stop uh, snapshot to be able to look at in real time to see where does the each deal stand. So again, if you're doing 10 of these a month as an MSO or a PE fund, you'll be able to understand where does each one of those deals stand and, and which buttons do you need to push to sort of get moving um, the deals faster. You can also reprioritize what is the priority deal that you want us to be working on through that dashboard so that it's all real time and we're quickly responding to when you need the information to, to close your deals. Uh, and lastly, we created what we call a digital file cabinet. One of the issues that we have noticed in, in studying the difference with the add-on acquisitions is oftentimes the buyers have multiple service providers to do the different transactions they need. They have one provider to convert cash to accrual. They have somebody else doing 805 valuations, which is sort of the opening balance sheet valuation, um, and another firm doing diligence. We created sort of a bundled service where we can do all three and do it more seamlessly using our digital file cabinet. So this file cabinet captures not only the data book from our diligence, but also all significant uh, documents such as loan agreements, compensation agreements, contracts, uh, and also key emails that we have with the target. There's a lot of information that we learn in corresponding with the target that doesn't make it into a data book, but it's valuable information for the buyer to know and understand the target as they're integrating and, and working with them post-close. So we package all this information into the digital file cabinet, and then we can pass that on to our uh, valuation group first, and they can do the 805 valuation. Again, we're sharing all the knowledge with them that we learned, so they're hitting the ground running and they're not calling the target asking the same questions that, they, that we've already asked. And, and then after the valuation is done, we can turn it over to our risk advisory group that actually will do uh, cash to accrual conversion using the buyer's chart of accounts so that they can convert the target's chart of accounts and, and financial systems into the buyer's system. So that way they, they integrate in it immediately and they can start utilizing the data and start making management decisions faster. Uh, and finally, is, is just the way we handle the communication with the target. We understand that we're representing the buyers. Um, and again, this is an emotional time for the sellers. So we're making sure that we're, we're handling them appropriately. We're being patient where we need to be patient. Uh, we're providing education, like Mike said, so the buyer, the seller understands what they are um, being requested to do. And, and just trying to make the process much more pleasant, so to speak, for the seller during these emotional times for them. And we find that's we found that's really critical um, in, in making the deals move forward and close and then post close that the relationship is still really strong between the buyer and the seller. That's great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mike, anything to add? Yeah, what, what's been interesting to me is really uh, based on the volume uh, of these deals and the, the speed at which they move, we really have become an extension of our clients deal teams. And so I think that's evident in our inclusion in some of the pre LOI stage planning, as well as the post transaction integration work that happens on these deals. And so I, I, I do see that as being highly valued by our clients. Well, thank you both, Steve, Mike, for joining us. Thank you all for listening to the drawdown. For more information on Cherry Beckert's healthcare transactions practice or our micro deals experience, please find us on our website, cbh.com, or on our social media platforms. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to The Drawdown, Cherry Beckert's private equity podcast. 
The views presented by our guests do not necessarily represent the views of their respective firms. For more information on how Cherry Beckert serves as a guide forward to private equity funds and their portfolio companies through accounting, tax, and advisory services, please visit cbh.com.